base is not only high, it's low, it's a bottomless pit. The Interplanetary Podcast, the exploration of space for the benefit of all mankind. Your hosts here in London, Matthew Russell and Jamie Franklin. Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, baby, Sunra. Matt, we were perfectly in sync. Just like Sunra used to be in sync with the minor chords. And augmented polyrhythmic shift. Well, I taught him everything he knows on you. Absolutely. And, and he was very, very hot on his tonal shaping. Do people still call me polyrhythmic J? <laughs> Big time. Yeah, that's Down what on, they did. Only, only, only on the street. Only on the yeah. street. Yeah, it's more of an urban thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So who's, whose birthday shout out is it today? To Mr. Joseph Percival Joe Allen the Fourth. Wow. Bit of a mouthful, isn't it? That is a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. June the 27th, 1937, former NASA astronaut. How many uh, hours was he logged? 3,000 hours in jet aircraft. And he's, he's not really a pilot. He's, this guy's like a brain box. That's quite a few hours, isn't it? Yeah. He's got a Bachelor of Arts in Maths and Physics. He's got a Master of Science and a Doctor of Philosophy in Physics from Yale Oof. University. Oh, that's not shit, is it? And, and his thesis was the studies of odd A nuclei in the 2S1D shell. <laughs> oh, come yeah. on. <laughs> come on, That's not Getty. a thing. If you're not all rushing out to download his thesis now, yeah. I want to know why. I mean, come on. What else is there to do on a Saturday? <laughs> exactly. You know? Um, I'm talking of Saturday, Jamie. Of course, we know we're supposed to get the podcast out on a Friday, but have we had busy weeks, Jamie? Oh, I tell you what, we apologise. But if you knew what we were up to, oh man, I, you I would just home... be—you'd just want to reach through the phone or your computer and give us a hug. Yeah, I got home at four o'clock last night after doing 15 hours of shows. Is this your stand-up again? No, <laughs> do, you just do, want to entertain do, the people, aren't you? Yeah, no, it, it was me backstage. Backstage God. Backstage God running around getting the show together. I did do a bit of comparing because the compare couldn't be bothered to stay till the end, which was good. Oh, God. <laughs> I hope, hope so, you didn't pay him his wages. Well, I think it had all been pre-agreed. Uh, fair enough. It's what's known as a stitch-up. Anyway, yes. Here we are. We are... We are still committed to space, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. If here's here's is one. If you want to know what um, if you want to know what Joseph Joe Allen looked like, he was he was in the film Armageddon. That's right. Be- because he yeah because he he was the consultant on the film, and he played a cameo in the film. He also flew up on a couple of space shuttle missions. And he he was uh, involved with um, one of the mission scientists for Apollo 15. So he goes way back, way back. Yeah, that isn't legend. bad, is it? That isn't bad. Mm. For a CV, it's pretty good. Oh, yeah, he's been there, done it. So, Jamie, this is going to be a quick and dirty podcast, but we've got yeah. a great interview. About, I'm, I'm going to apologise about the sound quality about the interview. It's, a, it's our intro to Space Habitats, and because I've got pretty much the whole of August off, Jamie, I think we mm. can. I think we can make August Space Habitat Month. Oh, I'll tell you what, August is going to be a good month, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be great. So we could have a quick rundown of what's been happening in the news. Let's do it. Let's breeze through and uh, let's massage well, our brains. I'm start, yeah, I'm going to start with a sad one, Go quite on. particularly sad. And that is, of course, Christopher Columbus Kraft passed away this week, which oh, is really sad. That is sad. Pretty much the, the next day, wasn't it, was Rutger Hauer your fave? Well, my fave as well, I have to say. We had a moment, didn't we, over oh, WhatsApp? I, what on earth were we thinking not opening the show with that quote? Can we, can we go back and do it again, Matt? <laughs> we have to do it. We have to do it. Right, let, I tell you, let's finish the show on that quote. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, Jim Bridenstine said, America is truly lost a national treasure. Today, with the passing of one of NASA's earliest pioneers, flight director Chris Kraft. Sad, isn't it? It's really sad. 
and Jim Bridenstine said, uh, we send our deepest condolences to the Kraft family. Uh, yeah, sad, isn't it? Yeah, so Chris, Chris Kraft married his high school sweetheart. So they'd been married a long time and they've got wow. a son and a daughter, Gordon and Christy Ann Kraft. And of course, he set up a very successful cheese company. He no didn't. way. That's just me. That's just me laugh, lying. Oh. Uh, um, yes, flight director. This, do you know what he's Chris Kraft said about the uh, flight director, which, of which he pretty much invented the role? Go on. Uh, he said, the guy on the ground ultimately controls the mission. There's no question about that in my mind or in the astronauts' minds. They are going to do what he says. Wow. So, yeah, make, be in no doubt, Chris Kraft was in control. He was the boss. That is not a bad quote, is it? Some There's some pretty big UK news this, this week as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the UK and the US have military space link up. Mm. Mm. So UK are going to be investing $34 million dollars over the next year for for a small la- for, for a launch of a constellation of small sats to provide live high resolution video uh th- which gets beamed directly to the cockpits of american aircraft oh uh yeah and, and as a result the royal air force is going to post one of its test pilots to the virgin orbit group Okay. So, yeah, so I would imagine what's going to happen there is something, you know, one of those high-resolution satellites being built at uh, Surrey Satellites or something like that. Yeah. Will we'll be flying up on Virgin Orbit, maybe from Cornwall. So maybe that will be one of the very first launches. Oh, yes. Is, are these military satellites for imaging down to imaging down to the cockpits of aircraft? So that's definitely one to keep an eye on. And so lots of British space companies are also sort of um, lining up to do various things. And there's one called Cobham, which bizarrely is, a, is the name of a, of a town very near Guildford where Surrey satellites are based. In fact, Cobham oh, right. is, in Surrey, is, in, is in Surrey, but I don't know whether Cobham themselves are based in Cobham. I know a Billy Cobham. Isn't he, isn't he the drummer? Uh, yeah, Billy Cobham is an amazing drummer. Great drummer. Who, ha- who has had some stints in Level 42, weirdly. One of our... But- one of our endorse I endorse this man. Oh yes, excellent. Well, yeah. I, I I have met him and and he's an inc- absolutely incredible drummer, like just ridiculous. Bit of a ledge. Uh, yeah, so they're they're um, yeah they're just about to get bought up for five billion dollars. That's how big these companies that you've never heard of are, and that's so that they can uh, position themselves for these mega constellations. It's making I love parts, that word. M- yeah, making parts for mega constellations. It's quite a few mega constellation news, but we should definitely talk about uh, the Chandrayaan two lunar we mission. We need to talk about India. Yes, yeah, yeah. So they that launched on Monday. Uh, that was after a, quite a few scrubs, but that that has now launched on the GSLV Mark three. Matt, if uh, I've told if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. I don't want no scrubs. <laughs> well, a scrub yeah, is a guy were... who can't get no love from me. I, t- I tell you What's what. What's the rest yeah. of the lyrics? Uh, um... Standing at the passenger side of a, my best friend's ride, trying to holler at me. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's good. Good lyrics. I think that's it. You, you're you're yeah. spitting some good rhymes there, Jamie. Just spitting fire. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that that it it's going to arrive at the moon round about my birthday. So that's going to be really exciting. Matt, could you tell the listeners when your birthday is? Uh, September the 10th. So you need to start, do they need to start saving now for your gift? Oh, absolutely. Maybe we should have a big Patreon <laughs> yeah. uh, run for September the 10th. I mean, guys, 10th. I'm just saying, look, a special, if a you special... put, just put, a, if you put a, if everyone puts a pound a week away till September the 10th, and then, you know, we could all chip in and buy Matt. What, what do you want, Matt? Uh, a rocket. A rocket. <laughs> a rocket, what do you think? It might be, have to be a, a slightly smaller one than the one India have got. Mm. Mm. We'll mm. see what we can do. Mm. Um, Jamie. Yeah? 50th anniversary of Apollo, been and gone. 
Yes. Um, Wasn't it and like great? I said, it was, it was awesome. But I, I really like this feeling of, of we can just look forward now. And yes. one of those things that we're looking forward to <laughs> is Artemis 1. And apparently the Orion spacecraft that's been built for Artemis 1 is complete. And that's what was announced by Mike Pence on the 50th anniversary. And if you want to see one of the most incredible videos I think I've ever seen... Yes. Is Trump in the Oval Office with Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins and Jim Bridenstine. And he's basically sort of like having this kind of open discussion. And he keeps. Yeah. And he goes, uh, Jim, why aren't we going to the moon? Why yeah. are we going why, to Mars? Why, why aren't we going we go to Mars directly? Why, <laughs> yeah. why, 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 why can't why we go straight to Mars? <laughs> yeah. And just, just why aren't we just listening to these guys? It's just like one of those kind of things of, mm, yeah, are we really running a country like this? This is yeah. crazy. The, the funny thing is, it reminds me of quite a lot of my bosses I've had over the years. Yes, it's <laughs> the, definitely the, the, relatable. The, the actual psycho ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that was, it's really funny. It's really funny. But basically, Buzz and Michael Collins can't hide their disgust, really, for Artemis 1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but never mind. Um, uh, Soyuz uh, has taken some people up to the International Space Station. Uh, uh, among them, uh, Luca Parmadano, of course, from ESA, uh, a okay. Russian, Alexander Svutsov, and, of course, Andrew Morgan of NASA have all gone up. So they'll be there till spring 2020. Parmitano and Svutsov will return to Earth in February 2020. Lucky buggers. Along with Christina Koch, but Morgan will stay on for later on. Legends. Uh, well, what I'd give Matt to to be up there. Yeah, I, t- I tell you what didn't make much of a uh, news feed Go was on. remember a couple of years ago we had the Shangon One or the Heavenly oh, yeah. Palace One that um, re-entered uncontrollable, uncontrolled re-entry into. That's what she said. Uh, <laughs> that that uh, the Shangon Two, which mm. was only you know orbited a few years ago and has, you know, had a couple of uh, Tychonauts on there. Mm. Um, um, that was deorbited on purpose this time and uh, and burnt up in the atmosphere. Aye. And that's it. Uh, but that's that. Yeah, yeah I, I think that was all planned and it, they were just a design for stepping stones for this massive Chinese space station that uh, China wants to complete in the early 2020s. Well, fair enough. Poor old Ariane, I've had to scrub the Ariane 5, so unfortunately there's another scrub for you there, Jamie. Oh, and that's God. because of this ongoing Vega July the 10th incident. Mm. Uh, so that's a bit annoying. One web, which I said I was going to talk about mega constellations. Yeah, here we go. One web uh, have, have opened a massive factory, huge factory uh, near the Kennedy Space Center uh, that's going to that's going to be churning out 30 satellites a month. Yeah, and how do they? How many are they getting up there? I mean, we're talking over 1,000, right? Actually, it looks like it's going to be doing 60 satellites a month. It's two a day. It's like Jeez. pumping out two satellites a day. Okay. Um, but, then, but some of those might be part of DARPA's Blackjack program. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, Matt. I've got a, I've got a game of poker with my mates um, yeah. on Sunday. Which mm-hmm. is tomorrow, um, and I would like everyone to wish me luck. I've never won in all the years we've been playing, and we've been playing for decades. I've never won. You've never won poker. I might have drawn once and split the pot, but I've but never won. You've obviously got a tell that your that your friends aren't telling you about. Well, I think what it is is I get a bit excited, and I and I do stuff where I go, okay, I've got a really great hand. I'm going to go all in. And then I well, forget you, that other people can beat me. Yeah, that you see, that's your tell. Yeah. <laughs> Getting excited. I just need to learn. I'm not going to get excited tomorrow. So next week, I'll let you know how I got on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, my God, Jamie. What? We should really talk about uh, China. Oh, I'll tell you what. We absolutely should talk about China. So Yeah, that Hyperbola 1 rocket yes. from iSpace has become the first private company to launch into uh, space, into orbit. And, of course, they're, they're actually uh, against two other companies, Landspace and OneSpace. So there's a lot going on 
in the Chinese uh, private sector. So that should be really... Of course, their private sector is slightly different from anyone else's in the fact that the government still have control. <laughs> yeah, right. But, right. But, but ultimately, that's pretty <clears throat> exciting news. Well, congratulations, iSpace. Uh, SpaceX have been extremely busy, of course. I mean, everyone's getting super, super excited that um, the Starhopper oh had its my first God. untethered flight. Not that you oh could see God. much with all the with all the smoke and everything, but yeah. it, it was that is pretty incredible, and it's massive. That thing is massive, and when they put the other Raptor engines on and they start building the other bits to it, it's going to be absolutely incredible so i think we'll probably talk about that more next week well our mate eric berger on twitter was just talking about just how big this thing is right and yeah how much we just i mean this launch when it happens properly is going to be just history isn't it? it yeah i mean it will make the falcon heavy launch seem like it was a delta four launch yeah big whoop what a bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, and they've also launched their Dragon cargo spacecraft to the um, International Space Station. That's now it's currently, as we speak, chasing the space uh, space station down, and that's delivering uh, two and a half tons of supplies. Big time. And it's the third time that that one's flown to space. So that's another first for SpaceX. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? It's um, damn cool. And my final piece of news, Jamie, is Mm. that NASA have announced that they will definitely do the green run on the SLS. So that's that's actually one that's well worth going to have a a see if you're in the area, is going to watch the green run next year, which is basically um, the core stage being lit up like a candle and tested. I want to watch the green run. Yeah, I, I definitely want to watch the green run. So, but it's gonna we're gonna to have to organise our um, America trip. We are. We need to do that. Yeah, yeah, we really do. We should go once a year, Jamie, shouldn't we? As a little we totally trip. should. We'd like all of our American listeners to let us know, like if we came over, what space cool stuff? Who could we interview? Where should we go and do a live poddy from? Have you got a venue? And who can put us up? Who can let us yeah. sleep on their floor? We're, who we're can both, we? We're both who clean can we and tidy, aren't we? Jamie? Sofa surfing. Yeah, we're both clean, <laughs> and we I mean, make you know, an excellent cup of tea. So, if there's any Americans out there who are confused about what a, a, a proper cup of tea is, which, which, to be honest, listening to uh, American podcasts when they mention tea, I, I, I'm in horror. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can, I can certainly show. Uh, our American friends how to make a lovely cup of tea and they can show me how to make a nice cup of coffee. What do you think? Absolutely. So that's, a, that's and a fair exchange, isn't it? You can hear Matt's various impressions, you know, yeah. Roger Moore and obviously yeah. Carl Sagan, but we I'm won't, like, we won't, we'll just keep that no. as a surprise. Come over here to do my David Bowie one, uh, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. It's not bad. <laughs> There's a certain era of Bowie where he talks like that. NASA announced Thursday it will proceed with a green run test of the SLS. <laughs> we'll presume, we'll, presume <laughs> we'll do that next week. We test. will read the entire notes as David Bowie. We are listening to the Interplanetary <laughs> Podcast. That is downloadable as a ringtone. Yes, Matt. Uh, it's interview time. Who we got? Who we got? Who we got? We got Niels Faber and oh. Angelo Vermeulen. Oh, yes. Uh, one was calling from Belgium. One was calling from Holland. I apologise for the sound quality and never didn't quite get this Skype one that good. Uh, it happens. It happens. But you said we're going to have to do this again, aren't we? We did mention that we were going to STEC and they're going to be there. So we'll try and hook up in person and get a proper one. But I think this works as a really good taster for Space Habitation Month. We will I'm, absolutely... I'm, I'm, I must I must mention, Jamie, that I'm reading a book called Space Settlements by Fred Sharman. And it's okay. excellent. It's really excellent. And uh, that was a, a book recommendation via the Discord book club uh, that we have uh, um, by one of our amazing patrons. So that's um, so I'm thank you very much. Oh, thank Rob you Anibal. so much. That's incredible. 
uh, Angelo and Nils, I, I believe, have both done TED talks and stuff like that. So they, they, they're pretty up on it. And um, let's roll it. Ecoute. Do it. The Interplanetary Podcast, putting the ace back into space. Hello, I'm joined on the podcast by Angelo and Nils. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Thank you. Uh, can you introduce yourselves, uh, what you're up to at the moment and the projects that you're working on at the moment? Yes. Let's go with Angelo first. Okay. I'm a biologist and a space systems researcher. I'm working at Dallas University of Technology. And my current research is actually focusing on interstellar exploration. And we're uh, designing new concepts for potential future spaceships that could bring us to different stars. I also have a background, as I said, in biology, and I'm also involved in space biology. One of the uh, research programs that I've been collaborating with for quite some time now is the Melissa Research Group at the European Space Agency, which is trying to develop a regenerative ecosystem for future space settlement. Uh, well, before we before we do a deep dive in that, what about you, Niels? What 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 are you working on? Well, uh, I'm a product designer with a background in 3D printing, and in the last two years, I've been uh, joining Angelo in his projects around uh, space habitations and space exploration. And so let's let's have a, a deep dive in the in the uh, in the mission that you were talking about early on with 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 ESA. Tell us a little bit. About more about that about the regenerative ecosystem the regenerative ecosystems that sounds pretty cool yeah um so one of the major challenges for long-term space exploration is the supplies if we go to the moon we can resupply the moon the moon is not that far uh we can resupply the international space station because in fact it's much closer of course than the moon but once we start venturing out beyond the moon or once we start building an actual base on the moon It's going to be really crucial to think about how we can uh, build a regenerative system instead of just continuously producing waste. You don't want to have, Mm. you don't want to be reliable on Earth all the time for every single supply. Now, the thing is, uh, right now, on board of the International Space Station, 90% of the water is being recycled. So we're on our way, but food still has to be resupplied all the time. And so what the Melissa system actually tries to do is to come up with a regenerative ecosystem that basically recycles all the waste that comes out of a human body that includes all kinds of toilet waste, CO2, even sweat, takes all those molecules and then gradually breaks them down into nutrients for plants that provide oxygen and food for the astronauts again. And the breakdown happens through a series of bioreactors with very particular microorganisms. So it's really, in fact, um, a loop of five different compartments that are all interconnected. Have have there been uh, any working prototypes of uh, Melissa built uh, and gone up to the ISS, or is this still very much sort of groundbreaking work on the ground? The Melissa project is still very much uh, in development. There are certain components that are actually operational, but the full system has not been completed yet. There is a pilot plant that is operational in uh, Barcelona, which uh, basically basically contains those five different compartments, but not all the connections have been fully completed yet. Now, there have been experiments of Melissa components on board the International Space Station. For example, algae are an important part in this ecosystem, edible algae. So these algae have been sent up into space on board of the International Space Station to figure out uh, how they would grow and develop the inside of the station under the impact of cosmic radiation and zero gravity. You could build the perfect regenerative ecosystem on earth but of course these organisms might behave very differently once they're in space so you need to know what happens uh, when you do that has there been any interesting surprises when those kind of studies have been done well maybe not surprises but it's it's more like it's a lot of work to uh, to, to to build a system like this basically the life of the astronauts will depend on such a system you really want to understand the system really well it takes years to fully understand every single organism within that loop now that said it is quite minimal approach if we think about, for example, the Biosphere 2 project, which was this massive project in uh, in Arizona in the 90s, where people were locked up with a very complex uh, ecosystem. But the Melissa system is uh, using an almost opposite approach. And what happened in, in Biosphere 2 in Arizona was basically stuffing 3,000 species together in one gigantic greenhouse complex and then locking that up with people. This didn't go perfectly as planned. Um, and the problem is, if you do this, you get a lot of 
of unpredictability and um, the system becomes un becomes uncontrollable. And what the Melissa system does is let's start minimal with just a few building blocks and gradually start try to understand the interactions between these building blocks. This is a much more secure way of developing an ecosystem for future space settlement. Who first initially came up with these ideas? Is, is this an idea that's been kicking around for a while? Who, who sort of thought, well, it'd be better to try these much more simple approaches? Um, interestingly enough, both Melissa and Biosphere 2 were launched around the same time, the end of the 80s. It's basically just two different paradigms that kind of... Uh, started developing their own uh, infrastructure at the same time. Now, the idea of using uh, an ecosystem in space to sustain human life, to sustain the astronauts, dates back to the 19th century. So it's a, it's a pretty old idea. And it's basically Tchaikovsky, one of the grandfathers of uh, space exploration. He was the first to actually start reflecting on this. And he has these very interesting drawings in which you can see rockets and the interior of the rockets are plants and astronauts floating in between the plants and the plants are actually providing the food and the oxygen for the astronauts. And that's 19th century. Mm. Yeah, Salkovsky was definitely a, a thinker. It's, that's, that's really interesting. You're considering this type of thing of how do you make life sustainable as uh, as a key yes. component to space habitation. Is there is there any other kind of c components like that 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 you feel you, we have to crack before we even go anywhere near you know thinking about things like sustainable habitats on Mars or or even the Moon actually. It's basically three components that that uh, I'm that we're interested in and the first one is what I just talked about it's ecosystems and ecological life support the other one is the actual architecture and how that has to be built and constructed uh, and how to bring sustainability into that equation and the third one is the psychology of, of living together now when we talk about the the architecture one of the things that's been uh, explored recently quite intensively by different groups of all over the world and different architecture offices all over the world is how can we use resources that are already out there in space? How can we use the soil on the moon or the soil on Mars to build architecture? There are different techniques for this. And this is actually something that uh, Niels knows much more about. Basically, they're exploring how can we 3D print architecture with these materials. But since Niels is a 3D sp printing specialist, he, he knows much more about this. When you're looking at NASA and ESA, they've both uh, put out competitions in the last few years on uh, these 3D printed uh, habitats for either Mars or the Moon. And what you see there is that we're actually, instead of making a habitat on top of the surface where you are exposed to the radiation, the, you could use the soil itself to cover up your structural uh, habitats and um, they've done tests on both the moon uh, regolith and mars regolith and they've been able to print out sort of these uh, blocks of a material that is kind of similar to uh, concrete this is both still very conceptual but they've already shown that it's a feasible way of constructing space habitats on uh, planetary bodies. Next to that, of course, you've got uh, asteroids, which can also provide body to construct a habitation onto or into. We see with the diversity of materials available there, the opportunities are incredibly diverse. I can talk a little bit about the specific techniques that uh, have been explored in how to 3D print with lunar or Martian soil. It's uh, because I've been I've been collaborating with a ar space architecture company and they, they developed, they, they were involved in some of these projects. Niels, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm saying something here which is not fully well understood, but the impression I have is that there are like three interesting techniques that are being explored right now. So there are basically like three techniques that I've seen so far. One is to bring a chemical binder like a glue to the moon or Mars and then mix it up with the soil to do the printing. The other uh, system that I've seen is sintering. Basically take the, the soil, the lunar soil or the Martian soil, and using heat, you sinter the small particles together. And then the other one that I've seen was a sort of lava technique where you would melt down the entire soil and then pour it into a certain kind of uh, structure. So these are the kind of techniques that, that are being uh, explored by different architecture studios in collaboration with roboticists. 
the first examples about the binder and the sintering are actually uh, both the mechanical principles behind it. So you put down a, a layer of material that you heat up in um, a powdered material that you can heat up regionally and that way it'll fuse to the previous layer that you've put down below. Adding the binder improves the mechanical properties, the, the stiffness of uh, the material you're printing, and can speed up the process as well. So those are actually one uh, one of the same technique. Is there examples of that where where companies are actually doing that as a as a construction technique, uh, actually on the earth already? So as in, it's a construction technique technique that that we're using without actually leaving the planet. Uh, the laser sintering is one of the most common processes currently used in 3D printing for functional uh, parts. That is next to uh, the FDM technique, which is uh, most easily described as the toothpaste or glue gun uh, technique where you extrude a filament. Yeah. Uh, those are already done on a large scale on it. But on the International Space Station, they have this FDM uh, 3D printer, which is created by Made in Space, already available. Uh, that's used to print spare parts or uh, tools, like uh, wrenches or uh, other specific tools they, they would need. In terms of around the world, are there any are there any countries or, or companies that, that are sort of leading the way in this, this kind of space architecture? One of the one of the interesting uh, places to look at is the uh, NASA challenges that are being put out, the three D printed habitat challenges. There's been a few, and then you can see that it's actually companies that are spread out uh, over different places. So there is, I don't think there is any leading country at this point. Honestly, some of these architecture companies I've never heard of before, and they seem to have been set up sometimes specifically to develop this kind of architecture it's basically a brand a relatively new field that is right now really booming uh with a lot of new players coming into to the field and a lot of new ideas being produced every single year yeah so it's, so it's a really exciting field to be in then i'm assuming absolutely yeah totally you mentioned those three kind of cornerstones but what about things like energy the ability to uh, come up with energy is that not a, a sort of fourth element or does that fall in one of those three no that's absolutely true you can only do so much with solar energy and especially i think for these some of these 3d printing techniques they do require quite a bit of energy um so the question is how that's going to be supplied locally uh, nuclear energy is one of the options and has been used in space before um, and is still under consideration. Um, but how that nuclear energy, how that reactor would specifically look like, uh, that is still under, under discussion. But on the other hand, for example, the Curiosity rover that is right now working on Mars also has a nuclear component. Probably a combination of nuclear and solar will be used in the, in the future. That's my guess. In the deep future, actual fusion might be interesting to to see what uh, to use that because the energy density for fusion is is very high but right now fusion of course is not fully developed yet and is not mature yet to be used even on earth or in space yeah i i've i've, I've read a lot of studies of spacecraft using nuclear fusion uh -huh. and, you think, and you think yeah it's 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 a long way off isn't it if, if we can't do it on earth we're, we're a long way off from doing it in space is there is there any particular really exciting thing that's that you you think's happening right now that you think is a bit of a sort of game changer when it comes to space habitation and well this whole field is there is there something that for you is just really, really exciting right now. I'm really excited about the inflatable uh, habitation that they've attached last year uh, onto the International Space Station, which has proven functional on the first try. I see a lot of uh, opportunity there. And then, of course, the space mining industry, which is going to kick off, will provide us with the tools in space to create functional habitations. Because uh, it's not realistic to send out rockets to start constructing these habitations. Once we have like the mining industry going, then I see loads of possibilities of having space habitations. I actually I agree exactly with Nils. I think two of the most exciting developments are both uh, inflatable technologies. Once again, they uh, are the ideas of inflatable stations are quite old. 
Uh, right now we have Bigelow. The module that is attached to the International Space Station now is, is made by a company called Bigelow, but the ideas are dating several decades ago. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of potential there to build inflatable space stations, uh, inflatable space hotels. There's all kinds of ideas floating out there. Uh, on the other hand, simply using local resources to build structures is, over the last 10 years, this has been fully embraced uh, with all kinds of beautiful proposals that have been used, that have been uh, that have been put forward. The interesting one is the Ice House, one of the winners of these uh, NASA competitions, using uh, water ice as a construction material in an environment in which it's constantly freezing. The advantage of using uh, water ice is that it's a very good shielding material and it's, it's very easy uh, to work with, especially if, if you have a nearby water supply, of course. So there's all kinds of very creative things uh, coming out there. Now, we're still a long way off of having a functional robotic system that can actually print architecture in space. I mean, we're, we're, we're not there yet, so this will, this will still take some time. Now, apart from these technological advancements, inflatable architecture, 3D printed architecture using local materials, it's, I think, also the, the, the context, the economic context of current space exploration has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. Elon Musk, of course, with SpaceX, uh, Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, and then a, a whole range of smaller companies that are really trying to find their, their position in, in this booming field of, the, of new space, because that's how it's, you know, it's called, right, new space. Yeah. Um, and this this... This is a nice, uh, how to put it, a nice counterweight to the uh, more slower and more careful developments that are happening in the larger space agencies, NASA, European Space Agency, they are they take much more careful steps. And I think some of these companies, they sometimes push uh, things a little faster, they can be a bit more disruptive, also because they're much more lean and they can focus their resources on very particular projects. And I think uh, the interplay between the, the knowledge base and the infrastructure that the big agencies have put in place and then the agility of that new space economy, I think that that is also a game changer. You've got China and India as well entering, going to be huge economic powers over the next 20 years. I think that's really exciting as well that you've got the Europeans, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians. It's it's proliferating on a national and a commercial scale, isn't it? That is very true. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got the really exciting things, but what are the, what are the things that you feel as though are, are the big blocks? Because for me... I, I always think that the psychological element of space settlement and space exploration is the really is the really tough one. Is is that something you would agree with, or do you think that that one of these other sort of three or four cornerstones are, are actually harder to overcome? Well, uh, I totally agree with that. And within our art collective seats, we. <clears throat> has a project with it which is called Seeker, and that's where we explore exactly that. So together with uh, people from local communities all around the world, we've created these concepts, uh, spaceships, art installations, and together with those local people, like over the course of, for example, a month, we create the architecture, the interior, and we look at how are we going to create our mini society in there. And after the construction is completed, we do these isolation missions in there. And uh, in these isolation missions, sometimes they're only a couple of days, sometimes they're a bit longer. But you can uh, immediately see how easy it is to get conflict popping up. So we also simulate that you have a mission control, which is your gateway to the outer world and we are in the last sequel we did we limited outside communication uh, simply to chat which is something that is uh, quite realistic if, you if you're talking about uh, further um, distance communications it's interesting to see how easy conflict emerges when you've got a small group of people in a small environment that has to get along with each other and then only has limited communication means to the outside world. From day one, there's conflicts coming, uh, popping up. But I think Angelo can talk a bit uh, about the high seas mission by NASA to explore this a bit further. Now, do you know the high seas program? Do you know about that? But, uh... We've actually had a couple of people who've done similar analog missions. We had someone from the My Mars 500. Mm -hmm. We talked about high seas, and it's a, it's quite interesting that the last one didn't go so well, did it? No, there was some malfunction. There was a, an accident, I think, and 
then they had to stop it after. I think after only a few days, they actually basically can decided mm. to cancel. Their missions went 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 very well. Yeah. I was actually the com- the crew commander of the first high seas mission back in two thousand thirteen. Oh. oh wow. I did a mission of four months, so I lived for 120 days together with five other people locked up in the high seas habitat. A very interesting experience. <laughs> so pretty much a life-changing experience, as you can imagine. The high seas program is really geared towards figuring out the psychology and social dynamics of people living in a confined space, uh, in space, and having to work together as a group over extended periods of time. It's really the, what are the what is the impact of, of confinement and isolation. On, on crew cohesion and on, on productivity of a group and on leader, how, how do you handle leadership in those conditions? Basically, basically there are really two main challenges. I, I, maybe there are more, but there are two main challenges that I, that I maybe want to talk about right now. And the yeah. first one is when you lock people up in a small environment, in a very challenging and actually dangerous environment with a high workload, how do you keep that group together and avoid people getting irritated, avoid, avoid small conflicts getting completely out of hand how do you keep the crew cohesion there cohesion is very crucial because it's been it's been empirically proven that groups that are more cohesive are more productive and are also just better are more able to cope with unexpected challenges as you can imagine if you're working together as a team for over a long time time and suddenly some unexpected problem pops up you can immediately handle that problem as a group because you're you're used to work with each other imagine you've been living isolated in each each person in their individual room and then you have to come together to handle that problem that will not work as well so cohesion for many reasons is a, is an important thing one of the results that came out of the high seas studies and it was published just i think was it last year or a couple of months ago based on observations that were done in high seas and hera another analog mission that is that is being run by nasa it seemed that it was very difficult to avoid at least one person starting to trail off and kind of start to uh, isolate him or herself from the group and this seems to be a very consistent phenomenon that after six months uh, more or less six months, at least one person starts to dissociate himself or herself from the group. And uh, the longer uh, months go, the more months go by, uh, more and more people run the risk of dissociating themselves more and more from the group. It's not fully understood yet why this precisely happens and why this roughly happens around six months. But it's definitely something they observed. And now countermeasures have to be designed and people, researchers try to, to figure out uh, what the cause of this is and how this could be this, this could be avoided. Uh, on the other hand, there is also another interesting uh, psychological challenge, which is it's not just within the group, but it's the the, the relationship between the the astronauts, between the crew, and mission control. Uh, there are countless examples throughout the history of space exploration where there were, there were tensions between the astronauts and, and mission control. There was even a strike at a certain point on board of, uh, mm-hmm. I think it was uh, uh, Skylab, right? I'm always confusing Skylab and Space Lab. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that's another, another issue. How do you keep communication between those two parties fluent and without unnecessarily conflicts or misunderstandings and so this is one of the, these are the things that the high seas program is really interested in is, is investigating so high seas is less about testing particular hardware to live on mars um, but it's more about social and psychological dynamics of, of, of isolation well with all that in mind is it, I, I know obviously both of you are, are heavily invested in humans going out into the cosmos but is that do you sometimes wonder philosophically whether we're, we're actually capable at all of doing that or do you think it is do you think it's our destiny or do you think that uh, we, we're really going to have to work very very hard to make it happen i think we'll have to evolve into a, sp- a space faring uh, civilization rather than like it's not going to go from one day to the other if we have the technological means to do it uh, we'll, we'll have to try and fail before we know how, how to deal with it. Realistically, do you do you see people living on Mars in your lifetime, or do you think this is this is a very long way down the track? I, I think Mars is quite uh, far down the track, but 
I, I do see uh, the, the possibility of these uh, leader bases on, on, on the, in the southern region. But this again will be more oriented towards teams of researchers and scientists rather than an actual society in space. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have this on the poles, don't we, really, where they're, they're still not quite a self sustaining uh, habitat, even on, the, uh, even on our own planet. Yeah, exactly. So, of course, myself, I've been thinking a lot about about these things. Um, and uh, there is the big picture, and then there is the very, the very um, uh, specific thing. What we just talked about is it, 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 true. Visiting the moon is something entirely different than building a scientific base on the moon. And that in itself is still something entirely different than building an actual colony on the moon where people spend a large part of their life, they might even get children there. They, uh, they built, they, they, they had, uh, there's agriculture there, people built houses there. So these are three very different stages. They require a very different kind of approach and, and, and technologies, of course. And I, I guess visiting the moon is feasible in a relatively short time span. Building a station on the moon is already way more difficult and it's the same thing with mars i think honestly personally visiting mars is still quite a long way off and uh, the difficulty mm. is mostly maybe not so much the actual surface of mars but it's actually the deep space the trends the, the, just the travel time and being exposed to deep space for such a long time we've never experienced this we've never practiced this nobody knows what's going to happen to the human body when it is traveling for such a long time through deep space, unprotected by the magnetosphere, under the impact of, of radiation. And yes, you could you could add some shielding, but you can never shield all that radiation. I mean, there's no way you can technically uh, realize that. So that's going to be that's going to be interesting to, to see. But on a larger philosophical level, um, if you look at the history of humanity, it's only logical we will move into this space. It's basically, if you extrapolate what happened in human history, we will end up in space. If you look at, for example, the early history of flight, in the beginning, before even the first airplanes were invented, when people were using balloons to go as high up in the atmosphere as possible, accidents happened and people actually died because they would go way, way up too high and they would not be appropriately, they would not have the tools and the technology survive high up in the in the atmosphere now right now only a, a bit more than 100 years after the invention of the airplane we are comfortably looking at movies we're reading books we're eating in at the same heights so an environment which is actually very dangerous for the human body has now become become an area where we where we're enjoying comfort and we don't even con we don't even think about the, the dangers that are outside there when we're on a plane so there is this gradual development in which we, we psychologically and emotionally conquer areas that are more and more remote from Earth. And this will keep on expanding. Now, low Earth orbit is becoming commercialized, and the national space agencies are going to start focusing on the areas beyond low Earth orbit. So gradually, we really build our presence deeper and deeper into space. And I think this is an, a process you simply will not be able to stop, even if you, if you would not disagree with it. It's going to happen anyhow. And I think our stance is more like, if this is going to happen anyhow, we might as well step into the discussion and join the conversation and shape the direction these things are going. I think that this is more or less how, how we look at it. Now, the work that Niels and me are doing for the Evolving Asteroid Starships Project, our, our concepts for interstellar travel, they fit into a vision in which humanity at a certain point will become post-planetary. And the post-planetary condition is, is it's, 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 it's quite a particular vision on, on what's going to happen to humanity. It basically means that humanity is spread out throughout the solar system and beyond in different configurations. Some part of humanity will still live on Earth, some people will live on the Moon and on Mars, but some people will live in space stations and spaceships and maybe even a, a mining station. So there's all these different configurations in which people can live. And so living on the surface of a sphere as Earth is just one of the options. That's the post-planetary condition. And I think this is really what, 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 is, what is driving our research to, to start thinking about that future per, uh, perspective of humanity. Uh, I mean, you must have got quite excited when Jeff Bezos was talking about O'Neill cylinders and things like that, that it's actually re-entering the public imagination, this idea of of 
yeah, being post post living on a sphere. Exactly. This fits in with the ideas that O'Neill popularized in the 70s, which actually go back to ideas that were developed in the 30s. Uh, and then now Jeff Bezos is picking this up again. So it's if you look at the history of space exploration, I talked about how Tchaikovsky was already thinking about biological life support and ecosystems in space back in the 19th century. You see how these ideas are regularly picked up again and then sometimes are forgotten again, but they keep on researching. It's quite interesting to, to see that dynamic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Is that are you both? Do you both read science fiction? What or or what was your what was the inspiration that 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 led you down into this quite a specific path? We're both big fans of science fiction, of course. The the hard science fiction mostly. Like the latest book that I've read was Delta V, uh, which is a fantastic book uh, by Daniel Suarez. Starting to notice is like how. All these books help me to find my way within the scientific discourse because a normalized version of reality, uh, by all the references references that are in there, you can go and uh, go back to the actual scientific research that they're referring to, and that's how to Seven Eves, which is another book, and Artemis, like the the, the hard sci-fi, really inspires you to come up with these more realistic ideas or like a more in-depth background. But what inspires me most is like when you go back to uh, the, the O'Neill cylinders, for example, how we can now revisit them and see about how some ideas were very naive and are totally worthless with the technology that we have nowadays and how we can reimagine and, uh, those ideas with the knowledge we have to do. Yeah, that's really interesting. Is there, is there any particular favourite that you have currently? To me, like, Seven Eves was really the one that got the ball rolling again for the, the base ships and the societal aspect of it. Um, without giving away too much spoilers, there's, of course, uh, the book is divided into two parts. And there's the near future part, which is the, the most interesting bit to see. And uh, then you've, of course, got the, the Mars trilogy, uh, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, which is also fantastic by Kim Stanley Robinson. And most of his works are, uh, are truly inspiring. And one more book that I really liked was Aurora, of which I forgot the name of the author. author. Aurora is by Kim Stanley Robinson, I think. Yeah. As well? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm quite, quite sure. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, of course, I'm also a big fan of, of science fiction. There's no way around. And I explore science fiction both in literature and movies, but also in computer games. Games are, 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 can also be an interesting uh, source of inspiration there. Um, and it's, it's, it's very much the same, similar authors that. Neil's brought up, like Kim Stanley Robinson and Neil Stevenson. But of course, there's also interesting tradition of, of um, which we, we tend to to forget, of early uh, female science fiction authors like Octavia Butler, Ursula, Ursula Le Guin, uh, uh, who bring on bring up sometimes different aspects of building societies in the future, uh, and can talk about things like gender fluidity and, and things like. That. So it is a, it's, that's the beauty about science fiction literature, that it is a very broad field and there's many different aspects of potential futures that are being explored. And actually the diversity of ideas is so much bigger than in science fiction cinema, which is much more constrained. Um, and it, I find often way less, uh, way less interesting. Um, but on, on, a, on another note, I'm also personally, I'm also a big fan of, I do read quite a bit of history and uh, right now I'm reading a book on Pompeii for example because I was there recently mm. and it just um, and, and, and there's, there's of course also the, the big picture books like uh, Sapiens for example uh, that gives you this, yeah. this big perspective on, on evolution and human history but I think it's really crucial to to for me to get a, to get a connection with this to be able to extrapolate into the deep future getting connected to the deep past enables you to think about the deep future 
we've had a, a really long chat and thank thank you very much for uh, coming on and doing this because uh, yeah it's that's it's been an eye opener it's it's certainly given me some great ideas to 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 move forward it's but really really a pleasure to talk to you and uh, yeah i couldn't i couldn't agree more the, the kim stanley robinson books are are really really good i'm 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 making my way through them right now and and sapiens is what what a book that is that is that is awesome yeah. <laughs> thanks very much i'll i'll let you get back on with your uh, busy days and and uh, and hopefully you'll come up with a way that we can all get into space yeah. quicker than <laughs> quicker than uh, this going at the moment of course and continue the conversation <laughs> the interplanetary podcast is Alive! How cool is that? So cool. And I can't wait to meet them both at Aztec. That Melissa project is really cool. That is that is like amazingly cool. It's Absolutely. all about how, how you recycle uh waste materials. Basically, without without this kind of Melissa system, uh space habitation is uh, it, it's a non-starter. So Completely it's mega mega agree. mega mega important. So so it's it's really cool. And just having that conversation has given me some great ideas for how we're going to do Space Habitation Month, Jamie. We all need to get involved, so please send us your thoughts. And uh, are you going to Aztec? Let us know. I'm going to finish with a quote. I don't need to look it up. It you is don't even need my, to look it up? I don't need to look it up. I'll tell you why, because it's probably, along with The Exorcist, I've probably seen this film over 100 times. And out of the 100 times, this is my favourite scene. It is mind blowing i mean it makes me have goosebumps just watching it before he died but now i mean come on and 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 harrison ford's face when he's watching it is almost like he's not acting because he's being just blown away by this speech and then this long blink that harrison does where clearly a tear rolls down his face but you don't know because it's raining and he made that last line up. It's just poetry, Matt. And not, only, and not only that, they literally had two hours of money left before that's the it. film ran out of money. That's it. And that's not the sort of time you'd expect your actors to be making parts up. <laughs> but I think <laughs> everyone as, will agree uh, that that's got to be up there as one of the greatest improvisations of all time in cinematic history. Shall yeah, I go for it? Oh, actually, Jamie, before you do it, oh. before we finish, no, before we finish yeah. on this space quote, I've got to pick you up on something, Jamie. Go on. You know how I like to fact check things. Oh, here we go. Um, um, you made one contribution to the show last week uh, with a fact of your own, your very yeah. own fact. And uh, of course, it was, the only, it was the only thing that people wrote in to complain about. Oh, uh, for f- uh, swans aren't the only birds that have a corkscrew penis. <laughs> <laughs> really? Uh, Who else? Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, one, one, one listener uh, said that uh, she was pretty sure that, um, that uh, ducks also have penises. She knows because her own pet duck likes to get it out quite often. Oh, God, right, uh, I'm and just yes. going to Google it. So all, uh, all, all your larger birds, Jamie, have penises. Your things like your emus and your ostriches, your ducks, your geese and your swans. Let's just have a look. I'm just Googling it. Do ducks have penises? Oh, great. A duck's penis is corkscrew shaped with ridges <laughs> and... Oh, God, I don't want to read on. Anyway, so now we've, <laughs> now we've cleared that up. I told you I, told you I was going to look it up. And you did, didn't you? I, I did. And, I, I, I was just I, having you I, all I can, on. I just wanted everyone to Google. I, I can only apologise to the only to birds I, with a penis. <laughs> but it was quite interesting that the others don't. That that, that most yeah. birds don't. And I'm so thank you for that, Jamie. I did learn most some, cocks a lot. Don't have cocks. Yeah, I, where, I'll where, put that out there. Yeah, that's that is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, there we so go. Jay- well, I'm, I apologise. So Jamie, let's finish. Let's finish on the quote <clears throat> before you start. Yeah, I'm just going to say bye bye, Spodcats. Thank you for being so patient this yeah, week. Thank Aug- you. August is going to be we love killer. You. We're going to have killer stuff in August because oh, Jamie and I aren't quite as busy as we've been in goddamn July. You want some content? You just wait till August. Mm hmm. Okay, you ready? You hit me with it. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships 
on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten Hauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. 